And now, the winner of the 2012 Randolph Caldecott Medal for the Most Distinguished Picture Book for Children is Chris Roshka for A Ball for Daisy. A Ball for Daisy is published by Schwartz and Wade Books, an imprint of Random House Children's Books, editor and art director Lee Wade. Chris Roshka's incredible mastery with line and color provides all the clues children need to read this wordless book independently. Daisy is fluently rendered in watercolor, pen and gouache on nearly plain backgrounds, suggesting a simple dog with few concerns beyond playing with her red ball. After Daisy's ball is destroyed by another dog, eight frames wholly capture her emotions as she moves from confusion to realization of loss to utter desolation. The final dark frame with Daisy turned away from the reader is but one example of Roshka's remarkable skill in creating raw emotion through illustration. Another trip to the park resolves the crisis as the two dogs meet again to play with a new blue ball that Daisy brings home to cuddle with on the couch. A Ball for Daisy is a buoyant tale of loss, recovery, and friendship that holds as many unique stories as there will be young readers and rereaders. Chris Roshkin, is my great honor on behalf of the 2012 Caldecott Committee to acknowledge your distinguished artistic achievement and to present to you the Randolph Caldecott Medal for A Ball for Daisy. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Before I deliver my speech, I would like to show a very short film um, made in honor of this occasion by Ingo Roshka, my son. Um, my book has about 35 pieces of art in it. Uh, Ingo's movie has about 250. I helped with the red bits. Thank you, Ingo. A while ago, my neighbor Dan asked me, what's new in Chris Roshka Industries? I've known Dan many years. We both left stiffish academic worlds at about the same time to pursue our iffy dreams in New York. Dan became an opera singer, and I, as you know, an illustrator. I said to Dan, my book won the Caldecott. Good night, nurse, said Dan. <laughs> This calls for a neighbor dinner. Over the last 20 years or so, Dan's family and my family have developed the habit that whenever something important happens, we have dinner together. Often what's happened is nothing more than having gotten through the week or preparing for the next one. In fact, almost every Sunday night, we have dinner with the neighbors. The neighbors are Dan, Kate, and Catherine. Dan I've known since we sat next to one another in the history of American Christianity in college. It was Dan who found us our apartment when my wife, Lydie, and I decided to move to New York City. When we arrived, we moved in directly across the hall from him with Kate, who is a dancer, a famous dancer, living immediately above Dan. We made a happy foursome. Then Catherine was born. Ten months later, our son Ingo was born. Catherine said hello to Ingo in the hospital when he was two days old. These are our dear neighbors. Two years ago, no, I'm sorry, two years after Ingo's birth, we Roshkas moved exactly one block downtown. Anyway, throughout all these years, we've had dinner with the neighbors, the neighbors as we refer to one another. I mention all this because I thought I might consider this evening just another dinner with the neighbors. Although what I'm about to say tonight, I would never say at a neighbor dinner, precisely. 
Nevertheless, it is the kind of thing we might talk about, only expanded a bit. This is a much bigger room after all. And considerably less cozy, of course. Let us there ref therefore return to the neighbors. We are in Dan's apartment, a high ceilinged room in yellows, reds, and browns. We will have hors d'oeuvres, nuts, olives, and some wonderful cheese, the favorite being a runny French one known to us as the face plant cheese. A glass of wine or a cocktail. When it is time to eat dinner, we will all get up from where we are sitting and pull the small table from the wall, drawing out the leaves, bring in a chair from the desk in the back room, another from the wall by the break front, perhaps the piano bench and one of the stools from next to the front door. We will lay a lovely tablecloth, crisp linen napkins ironed by Kate, silverware, candles, flowers, glasses, plates, carafes of water, bubbly and still, and bottles of wine on their silver traylets. Kate will then emerge from a kitchen that could make many an airplane galley look spacious with delicious plates of whatever is on for tonight. Dan pours the wine, red or white. Catherine pours the water, bubbly or still. Well, Christopher, says Dan, did you ever dream you would win the Caldecott? Actually, no. I never dreamed I would win the Caldecott. I never did. Really, I never did. But I did, once upon a time, after some other dreams, dream of being an artist. Cheers, Dan. Or maybe what I really dreamed of was seeing like an artist. I have never known a time when I didn't want to look at things, wanted to see things and draw them. I find it almost literally painful if I am denied a window seat on an airplane. And as to drawing, really, anyone can do this. You just need a little training. This basically consists of learning to forget what you know or care about. Broadly speaking, the training teaches you to shed one by one the thousands of meanings each light impulse hitting your eyes holds in your everyday brain. Important meanings which keep you standing upright, get you around corners, recognize your children, and so forth. You slowly must learn to get rid of these and treat light impulses just for what they are, light impulses, which you then transfer through your hand into lines and shapes and colors onto a flat something or other. There are techniques, many, many different techniques to teach you this. Uh, the equivalent of standing on your head is one. But if you want to skip the techniques and still know at least what it feels like to see like an artist, I'll tell you, it is much like traveling to a foreign country, especially in the first days of your trip. You look about you and nothing registers properly. You walk around in a kind of daze and then some hand grabs you from behind, jerking you back onto the sidewalk to keep you from getting hit by a bus. And if you're lucky, it's Ryan Gosling who's grabbing you, says Kate, <laughs> offering more salad. Yes, exactly. You stare like an idiot at the coins in your palm, uncomprehending. Everything is new. Nothing is familiar. You are no longer on automatic pilot. As a result, your mouth may be hanging open in a slobbery dog way. Your eyes are staring. You are apparently are from somewhere else. In short, you look like a blithering idiot and not unlike an artist. Because when you look and see like an artist, you are someplace else and the old meanings are gone. It's almost an out of body experience. Anyway, you learn to unlearn everything your mind knows about things to be an artist. I got that, I learned how to draw what I saw. Look, draw, look, draw. And then hanging around in the Borders books in Ann Arbor one day, I picked up a book by Vladimir Radonsky called The Pup Grew Up. And then I began to dream of picture books and making these myself. But looking at my own art, uh, drawings at the time and thinking of them as picture book illustrations, I could see that something was missing. The look, draw, look, draw, was not enough to make a picture book. For want of a better word, time was missing. Time needed to enter these pictures. Here's what I mean. First of all, what I don't mean is a narrative. Every moderately classical picture you can think of is packed to the gills with all kinds of narratives and the questions they provoke. Think of Botticelli's Venus. How did she get into that shell? Or Andrew Wyatt's Christina, why is she crawling? Not that, what I wanted was what Chinese scrolls have where a bunch of things happen at once. Unfolding as you go from one end of the scroll to the other, the point of perspective constantly changing. Or 
when a scroll depicts nothing more than a landscape, still time is contained in it as you walk slowly from one end to the other, or as you unroll it, or as your eye travels from bottom to top. And the paintings contain time in another way too, as you contemplate the movement of the brush itself, which contains the very time of the making of the art. Now, when you have time, or perhaps even to perceive time, you need memory. If you're reading a book, you must remember the pictures that came before. If you're painting the book, you must remember the pictures that came before, as well as the pictures that will come after. They say goldfish only have 10 second memories. I dispute that. I take care of a turtle named Elmo. I've nursed him since he was a tiny mite. He is now enormous, and one reason he's enormous is because I feed him goldfish. <laughs> he doesn't eat them all at once. He eats them a few at a time. It's actually a long and fascinating story about Elmo, but let me just tell you now. Uh, one day, a little boy named Manuel was watching me feed Elmo. Elmo. Elmo was making a pig of himself. He had the colorful wriggling tail of a large goldfish sticking out of his mouth, and he was chomping happily away when Manuel, normally not a very talkative person, said, that's not good for the goldfish. <laughs> no, indeed. And the other goldfish knew it and tended to live in the shelter of the rocks for some time after this for about a week. Goldfish memory lasts that long, one week. Now, back to me. Exploring this idea of memory in my own picture book illustration improved enormously the day I threw out my morgue. What's a morgue? A morgue is a collection of images, everything and anything. A morgue is, this is something you used to learn as an illustrator, something that you must have and must constantly update. I always felt nervous that my morgue wasn't updated. For me, when I began 23 years ago, it was newspaper and magazine clippings of everyday objects or settings or situations, like men shaking hands or small dogs or mountains or goldfish, etc. In short, a picture reference file. The New York Public Library, Library has an enormous one. Now you don't need any of this, of course. You just Google it. We are no longer in the Stone Age. Back then, each illustrator was expected to have a morgue and use it. You used your artist's seeing, staring at the light impulses from your illustrator's morgue to make a good artist drawing. So I threw mine away, which left me to rely on memory. For better or for worse, I would draw it as I remembered it. Why did I do this? I sometimes wonder. Well, for one reason, I found that when I painted, the better paintings were done at least in part from memory. And as a matter of fact, in any drawing, memory is essential. Even when drawing from a photo or a model or a photo of a model, the split second between looking at the model and looking at your drawing pad is a split second of memory. I merely decided to push that interval further and further, actually as far as it could go. This has its drawbacks, of course. I can, it can lead to some awkward moments, like when an art director with whom you have worked for years and whom you respect and admire asks you if you've ever seen a chicken and know what one looks like, <laughs> and also suggests Googling it. <laughs> this is true. To draw from memory requires a whole new set of skills. Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian philosopher, asked his students to name what the last person he or she spoke to was wearing. And if the student couldn't, he suggested he or she practice noticing. You may now try to remember what your roommate put on this morning. Artists have likewise encouraged developing a split second visual memorizing. Manet or Monet or Toulouse-Lautrec or somebody said something like, if you see someone falling from a roof, you must turn away and draw him before he hits the ground. <laughs> For me, the greatest memory painters come from the ancient line of painters in the classical, ever-evolving Chinese tradition. The discipline of this kind of painting itself is a communal act of memory as each painter spends years in copying the masters who came before, 
pulling into his hands the memory of the physical movements themselves. Approximately half of every show of Chinese paintings I see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art carries within, it, within its title, In the Style of. Sometimes painters have copied painters copying painters. In this way, the earlier painters are forever remembered. And when you gaze upon the slowly changing styles of the Chinese painters, who are all painting the same kinds of things, landscapes and flowers and figures, you see what emerges when you paint from memory, a vocabulary, a painted vocabulary to tell your tale, and this is what the Chinese painters are so expert at. Each practitioner in the long line of succession adds to or alters what came before him. Instead of flipping his brush like this for a pine tree, he flips his brush like that. Instead of dabbing his brush, he drags it. Instead of dots, lines. Or simply instead of thin and refined, fat and rough edged, which I particularly like. But back to picture books. You learn to draw what you see. Then you learn to draw what you remember. Finally, you have to learn to draw what you feel. The task of a picture book illustrator, I would say, is to remember a particular emotion, heighten it, and then capture this in some painted vocabulary so that the same emotion is evoked in the child, in the reader. I must make you feel what I feel, and maybe even more. And this is why memory is so essential, so helpful, so necessary, because really, emotion has always been and always will be embedded in memory. As soon as you work with memory, you have emotion. I think they are nearly inseparable, sometimes so much so that it becomes hard to draw. It can even be an imagined memory, a future potential memory. I made a book once about the death of a child called The Purple Balloon. I almost couldn't paint it. I made a book once about the death of a fish, Arlene Sardine, and I didn't have any trouble. There is less emotion in the memory of a fish, much as I like them. Still, I accept the death of a fish. This ability and inability to draw doesn't surprise me when it happens to me, but I've even seen results of this in paintings hanging in museums. There is another room in the Metropolitan Museum that is filled with Rubens paintings. Peter Paul Rubens, one of the great master painters, probably did not use the optical aids, lenses, and so forth that many of his contemporaries used, relying much more on his own preliminary sketches and his memory of them. And this is what makes his paintings grand. They are sometimes more, sometimes less, but always somewhat sketchy, at least the ones he finished himself. Even as they look like what they're supposed to look like, they never look rigid, they're shifty through on my way to the Chinese collection. When I was stopped by the nose of a woman, the painted nose of a painted woman, there was something wrong with that nose. Peter Paul Rubens married twice. In 1630, when Peter Paul was 53, he married Helena, who was 16. <clears throat> From all accounts, he <laughs> loved her very much and considered her the embodiment of beauty and maternal goodness. And then I knew Peter Paul was trying to make the nose of his beloved Helena perfect. Over and over he tried to get the nose and mouth just so, and in doing that he actually made it look like Helena's nose and mouth are going in one direction and the rest of her face is going in another. The paintings, painting is called Rubens, his wife Helena Fourmont, 1614 to 1673, and one of their children. I don't remember the room number, ask a guard. It's an enormous painting. Look at Helena's nose. Her nose is in profile, and there is a veritable mountain range of pigment in the delineating shadow, which you can well see if you bend down and look up towards the skylight. That mountain of pigment tells the tale. Too much emotion getting in the way of Peter Paul's painting. Now look immediately to the left at a portrait of, portrait of a woman in black. The model for this one is Helena's not quite so beautiful, at least one supposes in Rubens' eyes, sister, Susanna. The brushwork is marvelously smooth and easy looking. There is no trouble about the nose. Let us return to the neighbors because my glass needs refilling. Kate asks, was there any trouble with Daisy's nose? Yes, there was a lot of trouble with the, the nose of my dog, Daisy. 
lots of trouble, and not just about the nose, but the tail and the eyes and the fur, etc. I'll not soon forget what Lee said to me one morning after looking at my latest attempts. Lee is Lee Wade, who along with Ann Schwartz is most responsible for a ball for Daisy. Lee said to me, how did we ever go so wrong with this book? <laughs> I had been working on this book for so long then, I could hardly remember its beginnings. Certainly my son Ingo was very small at the time, and Daisy's ball was his ball, which he loved very much. It was yellow, I'm pretty sure. Daisy was the big black dog who lived on the 10th floor of our building, who in her exuberance took Ingo's beloved yellow ball and bit down just a little too hard and popped it. That I remember well. What I don't remember is, did it happen at our usual ball-playing spot, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, or did it happen in the elevator of our building? I don't remember. But I do remember Ingo's tears and genuine disbelief at the finality of the damage, the irrevocableness of the event, the unturned backableness of time. The, do the daisy I drew is not big and black, of course. She is modeled on a dog I only saw once in a bar at 104th Street. She was white, longer-limbed than my daisy, scraggly-haired, and quite amusing. I don't have a dog. I watch them. I imagine what they do. I had two dogs as a child, and I remember them well. But Daisy is neither. Daisy is very much a dog I dreamed up, which is to say she inevitably has a lot of me in her. Well, I hear Dan already washing up, and Lydie is starting to give me the big wink. I'll, all right, I'll close in a minute. So this is how I see making my picture books today. First, I'll draw what I see. Then I'll draw what I remember. And finally, I'll draw what I feel. I remember when I was a teenager on a family trip to Europe, standing on the balcony of our hotel room in Geneva, looking down on the street and then over the lake to the mountains. I remember I had just put down a careful pencil drawing I was working on, a copy of a photograph of a man on a horse jumping over a fence. I put the drawing down and went to the balcony. Cars and trucks were moving about below me, and a postman was shoving along his three-wheeled cart. I thought then that I would be happy doing any job so long as I could live in a place where I could see beautiful things. Then some years later, I was walking up a long, leaf-strewn allee in the small city of Arlesen in Germany, having hitchhiked there from my job as a caretaker of disabled children in another German city to visit my friend Bruce for an expatriate Thanksgiving. And as I kicked the leaves, I thought I could be happy living anywhere in the world so long as I had a job that I loved. I live in New York City now, not far from the room filled with Rubenses and the rooms that contain an ever-changing collection of the entire history of Chinese painting. And I have a job to paint pictures of things I see and remember and care about. For 23 years, this job has worried me, kept me awake at night, aggravated me, and always entranced me making me eager to dream of a next picture book again. I see Kate stifling a yawn. Catherine and Ingo are moving the chairs back and closing up the table. Before I go, I'd like to make my thank yous. Thank you, Dan, Kate, and Catherine. Thank you, Lydie and Ingo. Thank you, Paul, Eliana, and Bonnie for joining us, my brother and sister-in-law and niece. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Herb, and all the members of the Caldercott Committee for your enormous work and for the great honor you have bestowed on me. Thank you, Lee Wade and Ann Schwartz, for your persistence, patience, and thoughtfulness. If not for you, I wouldn't like my book half so well. Thank you, everyone at Random House. You are the nicest security staff. You are the best messenger center. You have publishing's greatest lobby. From the sub-sub basement to the president's floor, I thank you all. There is no finer publisher. And I want to remember the wonderful lives of Maurice Sendak and Leo Dillon, who showed us that our art demands a lifetime of devotion. I honor Lane, Patrick, and John, and all illustrators working today who know how hard our jobs and work is. And I thank, thank all of you tonight who by your attention and thoughtfulness make our work a little easier and the joy that it is. Thank you. Thank you very much.